We've been in a, ser- a sermon series uh, the last uh, two or three weeks on the mission statement of New Life Church. And as I stated last week and probably the week before, a lot of churches don't know why they exist. You know, we do exist um, to worship God, that's for sure, in a corporate setting, and that's why we gather on a Sunday. But we are, we are also the physical body of Jesus on this earth, right? Jesus <laughs> is here in spirit. He's in us, he said, but we are the... So he's here spiritually, but he's not here physically any longer. We are his physical body, and so we need to do the physical work. We're his hands and feet, all right? So there's things we should be doing, and and a lot of churches don't know what they should be doing. They just think, well, we just come on Sunday and, and try and make it through the hour, hour and a half, pay some money, and go home. I mean, that's what we, you know, we sing a little bit and listen to a message. But if that's, if that's your mission for church, you're missing it by a long way. So we have a mission statement here at New Life Church. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus, we will save, heal, deliver, and disciple. All right, we, we understand that everything we do is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we, don't, you know, we can't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit. And everything we do is in the name of Jesus, Right? And like I said, uh, two weeks ago when I talked about salvation, the save part of our message, we don't save anybody. <laughs> Jesus saves. But we're called to lead people to salvation, to, to lead them to a place where they can make a decision whether or not they're going to follow Christ. Right? Then last week we talked about healing. And, and we do heal. It's the power of God working in us and through us that brings healing. So it's Him that does it. But we're the conduit that we have to partner with that to do that so today we're going to talk about the deliver part and you're like yeah i get to save and heal but that deliver that's kind of a i don't get that what is that well to deliver literally means to rescue right biblically speaking it means to rescue and it it, it comes uh, one of the places they use the word deliver so it's all over in the bible but is in the lord's prayer matthew 6 our father who art in heaven you know that prayer Hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come, they will be on earth, and uh, and deliver us from evil. You know, that's in the Lord's Prayer. If if you go to the original language, and some of your translations are more accurate, the the most accurate translation of that line is, and deliver us from the evil one. Who's the evil one? Satan, the devil, right? And his demons, right? So there is an evil one, and it says deliver us from him. So what does that word mean? It means it means rescue us. So, what, so when, when the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? And he, he said several things on how to do it. But one of them included, ask God, ask the Father to deliver you from the grip of the evil one. Right? So that's pretty important stuff. And so the, the, the first point we're going to talk about this morning that you need to understand is that Jesus expects you to rescue people from demonic influence. All right? You're like, well, he expects me, what? What? Demon- I don't use my word with demons. I don't want nothing to do with that. Well, you're called to do something with it now, and then we're going to learn about that today. And this is, when we get done today, it's not a scary thing. This is not a scary thing. It, it can be scary if you watch Hollywood movies, but we're not talking about spinning heads and green puke or anything like that, and screaming and shouting and throwing holy water and crosses. You know, you don't, you don't outshout the devil, you outtruth him. And so I'm going to teach a truth today on, on deliverance, rescuing people, including yourself, from the influence of the enemy, all right? Uh, because Jesus expects us to do this. And we've been um, quoting this verse the last few weeks as we've been talking about our mission statement from Matthew 10. Because Jesus, and this is Jesus talking. He's really clear, and he's talking to all believers. He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. And, and, and freely, freely you've received, freely give, all right? So one of the things he tells us to do is to drive out demons, right? And we're like, are demons even real? Well, they're real, yeah. We're going to talk about that today. So uh, there's nothing to be scared of, and, and you've probably, there's a lot of bad teaching about demons, and even worse than that, there's no teaching about it in a lot of churches. They just, like, if you, if you, don't, if you don't talk about it, it doesn't happen. A lot of families operate that way, right? Don't talk about it, it's not happening. right? It is happening, we're going to talk about it, all right? But there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, but Jesus expects us to do it. He says it, he says do it. He says heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. By the way, last week, you know, we're, we're talking about healing. We're talking about, you know, in this whole thing in Matthew 10, 8, where Jesus said, you know, like raise the dead. It's like, yeah, it doesn't happen. 
Like, yeah, it does. And I, I, I told you about the guy, did I, about the lapsed Episcopalian from Hawaii that we ran into, that they prayed when his son drowned and he, he was raised back to life, right? So, but did you see the news? I think it was just this last week. There was a 14-year-old boy in Missouri, fell through the ice, dead 45 minutes. You see this in the news? And um, anyway, so they, 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 they work on him, they take him to the hospital, they work on him doing the CPR, doing everything, and after 45 minutes, the doctor comes out to the mom and says, it gives her the news that he never wants to give. We tried everything, and there's just nothing. There's nothing. And we tried, we had to finally call it. And um, <laughs> we... I don't believe in denominational labels. That's t- I don't know that I don't believe in it. It's just like I don't concentrate on that. But, but there are some churches that teach, okay, how do you respond to that? And then some churches don't teach. It just so happened this mom went to an Assembly of God church and had received teaching, all right? I'm not saying all Assembly of God churches teach the right thing, but the one she went to did. And she went into that room when the doctor came and told her, he's gone, we, we quit, we can't do any more. And she just started shouting in the name of Jesus. I, I command the name of Jesus, son, um, that my son be raised. God, raise my son from the dead. Woke up and he's fine. Pictures of him on the news, walking around. 45 minutes dead. So when people say, that, whole t- that, doesn't, that doesn't happen today, yes it does. Yeah, you can give God a hand for that. I'm telling you, it does happen. But it happens when people understand the authority they have in the name of Jesus and step out in that, thor- in that authority. That's when stuff happens, all right? So anyway, but, so we're moving on this deliver thing today. So this stuff works. But Jesus expects us to, to raise the dead, heal the sick, drive out, uh, cleanse the lepers, and drive out demons. And, and he said, actually, as a believer, those, that should just follow you around. In Mark six, uh, chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, we also talked about that last week, Jesus said, these signs will accompany those who believe me. And what's the very first thing he says? These signs will accompany those. What's the very first thing he says? They will drive out demons, right? Isn't that what it says? That's what it says. In my name, they'll drive out demons. And it goes on to say they'll do other things. They'll they'll lay their hands on the sick and they'll get well. That's an expectation of Jesus Christ that we as his physical body are supposed to be doing on this earth. All right, that's our mission. And, and we need to learn to do that and have the boldness and the faith to step out to do that. And that's what we're trying to teach here. And, and a lot of you are stepping out and doing it, and it's awesome. It's, it's, it's changing lives, and, and that's what we're called to do. So this whole de- um, deliver thing, it's like delivering from demonic influence. And so the question is, well, how, what are demons and how do they influence us? And, I, and we want to answer that today, all right? So we're going to answer some questions, but what, what are they and, and how, do they, how do they influence us? Um, well, demons are, are basically fallen angels. Um, Satan was an angel. Did you know that? Satan was an angel. His name was Lucifer. Lucifer, actually the name of Lucifer, is, it was meant to be a really nice name. It means light bearer. I think that's a nice name, right, Lucifer? And uh, he, was, he was like the worship angel in heaven. And in heaven, angels have names and they have as- assignments. And there's a hierarchy. It's like, it's like an army. In fact, the Bible sometimes refers to God's angels as right, his army of angels. So they're, they're, and they're um, organized, structured like an army, army with higher-ups. And, and they have names and they have assignments. They're, like this is their job and this is their job. For example, you've heard of the angel Michael, right? The Bible says he's an archangel. He's like a war, warrior angel, right? So he has a name and he's an assignment. And says so there's lots of angels assigned to work underneath him, all right? So there's a hierarchy there. We know that from the Bible. There's also a, a, an angel named Gabriel. He's a messenger angel. He's the angel that came and... Uh, and told everybody about what was happening when Jesus was born, right, on earth, right? And, and it says that he commands angels, but he's a messenger angel. So he has a different assignment than Michael. Different name, different assignment. And underlings, right? And then uh, I, think, I think Raphael was referred to in the Bible as an angel. Um, cer- certainly Lucifer was an angel. He was the worship 
angel, the lead worship leader in heaven. So he was the most beautiful of all the angels, and he had angels underneath him. But at some point before the creation of man, Lucifer rebelled against God. He wanted the worship, all right? And, and he wanted to be like God. And, and you think, oh, that's terrible. But we're, that's kind of our default position. You know, a, lot of, a lot of us at some point in our life are like, hey, God, thanks for creation. Thank you for everything. I'll take it from here, right? <laughs> so before you get, you know, bust on Lucifer too much, we, we, we kind of have so, sort of that. But God, that's what we're saved from, all right? So when we accept Jesus as Lord, we're saying, oh, right, okay, yeah, I'm not God. You are. And I trust in you for my eternal life. So, so we're okay. Um, so anyway, so angels in heaven have hierarchy, they have assignments, and they have names. When Satan rebelled against God, the Bible says he, a, a third of the angels in heaven followed him in that rebellion. And they were all cast down to earth. All right, so we don't know how many that is, but it could be millions. It could be hundreds of millions. We, we know it's a lot. Because it said they were like stars in the sky. All right? And there's, there's countless stars in the sky. So, there were, <laughs> so we have what were angels in heaven, now still are angels, but they're fallen angels, cast out of heaven, down to earth, under the leadership of Satan. And the Bible even identifies other leaders under Satan that a lot of people think is just another name for Satan. Like when you read, oh, I don't remember where it's at exactly, but the, the name Apollyon, that is not Satan. That's one of his underlings. I mean, he's high up. Um, you heard the name Beelzebub. People call this um, Satan Beelzebub. Beelzebub's not Satan. It's an underling, under Satan. So the Bible names these demonic underlings who were once angels also, who serve under Satan and, and demons who serve under them. And they have assignments. The, uh, um, some of them are named. Uh, and Paul says in Tim to Timothy, you've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Okay, we think that that's an attitude of fear. No, it, he literally means, when you look at the original, lang original language, he literally means an evil spirit of fear. Right? So we know that there's a spirit whose, whose assignment is to bring fear. Um, confusion, where, every, where envy exists. Uh, where's this at? Uh, James, I think. Uh, um, what? James? 3.16? Where... Uh, uh, Envy exists, envy and jealousy exists. Uh, confusion and every evil thing will be there. So, so we know that um, uh, confusion is an assignment that, that a group of demons is assigned to bring. Confusion to your life, fear in your life. And, and we see that a lot in people's lives, fear and confusion working together. Anxiety is one of them that's not list necessarily listening to the Bible, but that goes on and on and on. So, so they have assignments, and they're, they are real, and their assignment is to mess you up. Demons cannot keep you out of heaven, <laughs> but they can make your life here very unpleasant and very unfruitful, right? The Lord says, Jesus says he wants you to bear fruit, right? He wants you to have, uh, in fact, they named the fruit in Galatians, right? L uh, Love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, goodness, gentle, all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, Satan, because he can't keep you as a believer from going to heaven, he can keep you from being fruitful. And he can make your life here really unpleasant. And one of the ways he likes to do that is to ruin relationships between people, family members, spouses, co-workers, church people, <laughs> all kinds of people. He wants to drive wedges between people because God died, sent his son. Jesus died for relationships, right? First and foremost, our relationship with God the Father, right? Because that's so important to him. But also relationships for others that they could be mended and whole. But, but Satan wants to break that apart. And, and he does that by influencing you. And so it's like, well, how, how does he influence? Um, to understand that, you have to understand how we're made. And the Bible is, is pretty clear that we're made up of three parts, body, soul, spirit. Um, this body is carbon atoms, water, mostly, right? And there's got some nerves in there that carry electrical impulses and, and, 
uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a organic machine, right? But we're also we also have a soul. That's that invisible part of us. That's our mind, our will, our intellect, our emotions, our personality. It's who we are, right? That's your soul is who you are. Because if you didn't have a soul, you'd just be a pile of organic stuff, right? With wiring, like nerves, you know what I'm saying, wiring, right? And hydraulics, you know, your muscles, <laughs> you know, that's what you'd be without a soul. And so you have a soul, and that's who you are. And this body won't live forever. This is a temporary body. We're going to get a forever body later for those who believe in Christ. Right now, this one's eventually going to turn to dust, but our soul will live forever in one of two places. Without Christ in a place that's no good for eternity or with Christ in a place that's awesome for eternity. All right? You're, every soul ever born is going to live forever somewhere. The decision is yours where it, where it is. Even though you've made a decision to live for Christ and accept him, the enemy still can attack that. So how does he do that? The battleground is your soul. That's where the battleground is because that's where your mind is, your will, your intellect, your emotions, all that stuff. The um, best way I can explain it is, um, you know, your, your, your body and your soul uh, yeah, your, your physical body and your soul work together to experience this natural world, right? Like right now, there's, my eyes see different light reflections. And my brain, so it sends it to my brain, and actually my brain sees it upside down. Did you know that? So my brain turns it right side up, and it, it, it makes all those colors and reflections so I can see faces that I recognize and people I recognize and furniture I recognize. And that might not do anything until... Until it hits, you know, my soul starts kicking in. All right, my mind, my will, my intellect. It's like, hey, there's Gary Heddington, my, old, my roommate from school. I wonder what he's up to. Oh, he's got two wrong shoes. Isn't that funny? It makes me laugh. Right, so I look at his shoes and I laugh. Right, because my soul laughs, right? That my soul thinks it's funny. My body just sees it and tells my soul, you decide what to do with it. You know, if that's, is that sad or is it funny? Well, to you it might be sad. To me, it's funny. <laughs> You understand? And I, I talked about smells. You know, your uh, smells evoke more emotions than any other, other, other five senses. And, and, and where are your emotions at? Your soul. The seat of your emotions are your soul. So I can, if there's a particle of something fresh, fresh cut hay in, in, the, in the air, an invisible particle, and it goes and hits my olfactory nerve in my nose, and my brain says, um, that's, that's hay. You're smelling fresh cut hay. Great, smelling fresh cut hay. But for me, because I'm a recovering farmer, I smell fresh cut hay. It's like, ah, oh, that is awesome. Yes, I love this time of year. My wife's like, roll up the windows. It stings. Give me hay fever. I don't know. She doesn't have hay fever, but she doesn't like, she doesn't like that. I, you know, we, like different, you know, we like different smells, right? They mean different things. Fresh tilled soil. In the, you know, it gets turned over in the spring. The smell that's like, oh, that's good stuff right there. Brownies. I smell brownies somewhere. <laughs> Fried chicken. When I come home and my wife's making chicken, it's like, oh, my soul is happy, right? So my, my soul and my body work together, right? Even though they're separate and eventually will be separated, but, but they work together. And so my soul enjoys or not, it experiences this natural world through my body. Much like our soul experiences the natural world through my body, my soul experiences the spiritual world through my spirit. Right? Because I am spirit, right? Body, soul, spirit. And you can experience unseen things, unnatural, or I should say supernatural, you can experience those in your soul through your spirit, just like you experience natural things in your soul through your body. Are you tracking with me? Yes? No. Okay, so you understand how you, you can, but a lot of people are just kind of dead because we're, before we're saved, our spirit's just kind of dead, the Bible says, and when, when the Holy Spirit comes in and moves in there, it just like, it kind of like wakes up, like, oh, hey, let's, yeah, hello. And, and, so we, and so we experience things, like that's how you can hear from God. Now, God has been known to speak audibly. 
I've heard that maybe once, maybe, but he's, he talks to me a lot in my spirit, right? It's not audible, it's not sound waves. He speaks to my soul through the spiritual realm and I, I get it. Uh, there's a lot I miss. There's probably more I miss than I get. But I get some because he speaks there, right? And that's how we hear from God. Through that spiritual realm, not necessarily through the natural. Although we can read the Bible in the natural and then be affected in the spiritual. That's a whole other story. But just as God can speak to our soul, so can the enemy. So can the demonic realm. Now, they're different than, than God. God has these three attributes that no one else has. Not Satan, no demon or anything. Omniscience, omnipotence, and uh, uh, what's the other one? Omnis- uh, all-knowing. Uh, ever present, right? On the on the presence, God uh, knows everything. That's why you can think your prayers. You can think a conversation with God. The enemy can't do that. The enemy speaks to your in the spiritual realm to your soul, but they can't read your soul. They can't read your mind, right? Because they're not omniscient. Only God has that. So if, if we're going to talk to the enemy, which like, why would I talk to him? You'll learn later why you will. Um, uh, you, you have to speak it because they can't read your mind because they're not omniscient. Um, they're not omnipresent. In other words, God is everywhere present. That's why you can have as much of Jesus as you want because he is like 100% there for you and you and you and you and you and you and you know, everybody. It's like, oh, I don't want to hog Jesus. You know, I'll just do my own thing. I don't want to hog Jesus. Like you're not hogging him. He's, it's omnipresent, right? Satan is not omnipresent. He can be in one place, one time. That's why he needs a whole band of demons to do his work. A lot of people say, well, Satan was really attacking me the other night. Well, by extension, I guess that's technically right, but probably Satan was probably not attacking you. One of his demons that has an assignment to carry out may have been, but probably not Satan, because he can be in one place at one time, right? Because he's not omnipresent. Uh, he's also not um, all-knowing, omniscient. Is that the other one I was talking? He doesn't know. Oh, he's not all-powerful. That's what I talked about. He, he, God is all-powerful. Satan's powerful. Demons have some power, but they're not all-powerful. All right, so they don't have the attributes of God, but they can speak to your soul, and that's where the battleground is. But a lot of people don't even realize that it is a battleground. A lot of people think it's just, it's my own thoughts whether it's from God or a, a, a demonic influence. Um, <laughs> what, what I think, uh, you know, the, the demons just, did, did you see how she reacted to you? Did you see how she rolled her eyes? You, you, she's got an attitude. And you better, you better nip that right now. That little snit needs to, she needs a, she needs a lesson. And you're going to be the one to teach her lesson. You just, you just lay it on her right now. And, and we're like, yeah. A little sn- you can't, I got a word. <laughs> and, but, and, you, and you think that's you doing that. And it's the enemy trying to influence you. Because here's the truth about the enemy. The enemy, uh, demons are empowered by your agreement. Okay? Demons are empowered by your agreement. That's the only power they have is influence, is to speak to your soul hoping that you'll act on it. Okay, truth. Satan and his demons were defeated on the cross. Absolute truth. True. You're a child of God. right? And you have power and authority. We're going to learn that later. That's the next point. You have power and authority. But So how... How... How are they still at work? Because we know the demons are still at work. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't say, cast out demons, right? i gotta, I got to take a, par- a timeout paragraph here. Okay, i got to remember where I was. We're talking about how they influence your agreement. Okay, make sure, help me to remember to come back here. Because i got to, this is important. As a Christian, you cannot be possessed by a demon. You cannot. Because possession denotes ownership. And when, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are owned by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, and He comes in and resides with you, and He's not going to share His temple with a demon. He will not. So your spirit is perfect in the eyes of God when you get saved. 
Your soul is a work in progress, right? Your spirit is perfect. And it's not going to be corrupted by an evil spirit, all right? Your spirit. So you cannot be possessed. You can, however, be what we call oppressed, influenced, hammered with. If the only, their only way to oppress you is to, to speak things to you that they hope you will act on that will really mess up your life. But when they speak it to you, it seems like really good advice. Like, put her in her place. I, I, had a, I shared this this morning. It's a good example, but, um, and I didn't ask my wife permission to share it, but I shared it before, so I'm going to take a chance and share it now. So, <laughs> you know that time in your marriage when you wake up and you're not in Kansas anymore? <laughs> you all have been there. You, you know, it's like, oh, this isn't like the movies. Like, this, you know, right? And so, so if back in the day, this is long before I was a pastor, but anyway, um, so back in the day, <laughs> when my wife would do things that I didn't agree with, it was like, don't reward her poor behavior. If, if you show her kindness and love, you go give her a hug now, you show her kindness and love, that's going to reward her poor behavior. That's like going to throw fuel on the fire. And you'll be dealing with it the rest of your life. No, 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 no. You, you shun her, you, you give it to her both barrels, you, you shut her down right now. This is getting out of blah, 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 blah. And, and this whole idea of don't reward her poor behavior, I thought was my own brilliant idea. How brilliant. Do not reward poor behavior. Yes, that's what I will do. I will not do that. I will not reward poor behavior. In fact, I will rain down on it so hard that when next time there's poor behavior, nobody will want to even come close to that because they know I'm bringing the heat if they do. Sounds good, right? Uh, it sounds stupid now because I'm telling you that after this. But, but, the, but the devil can try and convince you that that's a good, good strategy. He convinced me of it. And I, I remember I, then at some time talking to Pastor Joe here when we were just starting to attend church here. And I'm like, like well, I just, you know, I, I do the smart thing. I just don't report poor behavior. He goes, oh, that's a terrible idea. I'm like, what? You're my pastor. You've got to agree with me, you know? And he's the one that kind of opened my eyes to that. And I need, you know, I needed to get like biblical teaching on it. I needed to do what the Lord does, you know? Because it says uh, the kindness of the Lord draws people to repentance. So I should, I mean, it's not my job to draw people to repentance, but my job to be kind to people no matter how they treat me. So anyway, so a lot of your good ideas aren't your ideas and they're really bad because they come from the, from the enemy and they're to, they're to break up relationships or to cause, you know, troubles in your life, whether it's financial troubles or you've got to have that car, dude. That is so you. And you got you need but that that I'm not saying <laughs> if you got a new car and, and I'm not saying the devil made you do it I'm not saying that <laughs> don't take that home but it, it might you know what I'm saying because like oh you know what you don't make you feel good right now go shopping and that's not just that's just not like a woman thing because like I'm there it's like I got comfort eating shopping that's me let's go to Great Falls and buy something that'll make me feel better right but the enemy feeds into that stuff. And he, he wants you to act on it. All right? And that happens in your soul. And, and so do you understand how that can mess things up? But that's the only power they have is agreement. That you agree with it. Because you're like, I would never agree with the enemy. Yes, you would. When you agree that it's a good idea to, to uh, not reward poor behavior, you have heard from the enemy. And not only do you hear from it, you think it's a great idea. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And we, and we act on it. And the enemy's like, <laughs> got, it, got it going on. They don't even know it. They don't even know it. That's why Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 10.5, I think. He said, uh, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You have to take every thought captive because every thought is not your own nor is it God's. It could be the devil's. You could have some really bad ideas on your own. Don't get me wrong. You don't need the devil to make a bad decision, okay? But, but the devil will, won't help you make good decisions 
If the devil's speaking to you, believe me, it's a bad decision, clothed in making something look really good, or, or reasonable, or logical, or whatever, whatever you want to say. So we have to, we have to be like a guard. <laughs> like when that idea comes, we have to get the gun out, like the sentry, right? Hold it, thought, stop. Are you friend or foe? Because sometimes the devil, can, and he does this on purpose, he can sound a lot like God. I mean, think about what the devil, how he tempted Jesus in the desert, right? You read about in Luke. How did, how did Satan tempt Jesus with, with Scripture? I know, I know people who know ten times more Scripture than I do and are just <laughs> really influenced by the devil. It's like, how can that be? Because the devil will take truth, even sometimes a lot of truth, and put a twist on it and, and, and make it go off 180 degrees in the wrong direction. And he, does, and he uses truth. He, he doesn't take something that's like, that's not true. He'll, he'll, a lot of times he'll start out like he did in the desert with Jesus. It is written. <laughs> yeah. So if you ever hear it is written, or the Bible says, you better, stop, you better get your gun out and say, hold it right there. Is that God or the devil? Because they can sound a lot alike. That's why you need to know the Word. That's why we have daily Bible reading plans here. And that's why we encourage you to be in the Word because you need to know the Word because when Satan uses it and perverts it, you say, that's out of context. That's not what that says. But if you don't know that, it's like, well, the Bible says, and so that's what I'm doing. Right? So you, <laughs> anyway, he'll just twist and pervert that. And you, need, you need to take every thought captive so you don't get fooled by that. So, you know, I, if you're thinking, because I thought this, and you should be thinking this if you haven't thought about it already. Well, so if, if Satan's defeated, if Jesus defeated him on the cross, and I'm a blood-bought child of God, why are we even messing with the devil, right? I mean, how, how can he do that? Well, again, it's, it's the agreement. But then how does that get the access? Because that gives him access. We call it like open, an open door or legal consent, right? So when the, when the devil says something to us or gives us a lie or we participate somehow, we're, we're giving our agreement to him. It's like a legal contract because God has given us power and authority on this earth, has he not? He has. Read Genesis. <laughs> and, and he reiterates it in Matthew and he got the keys back. Jesus said, got the keys back, I'll give you power and authority here on this earth, all right? So we have the power and, author- and authority to agree with the devil. I mean, he doesn't want us to, but we have, we have that free choice to do that. When we do that, we've entered into, as far as, as far as the Bible's concerned, as far as Jesus is concerned, and as far as Satan's concerned, a legal contract. Because we have power and authority. We have power and authority to execute, execute contracts on this earth. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose. Whatever you bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Loose on earth will be bound in... You, you know what I'm saying, right? That's this legal contract thing. And so we have to start getting out of some contracts. Can I give you some good news? You also have the power and authority to break contracts. And that's what you have to do. There are so many Christians. Um, well, let's move on to the next point. So I'm not come back to this and tie it together. The next point is you do have power authority. Jesus has given you power and authority over Satan and his demons. He says it in Luke 10, 19. He says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, overcome all the power of the enemy. All the power of the enemy, not some of the power, all the power, giving you power and authority to do that. How do you do that? Well, a lot of Christians get it half right, but half right works 0% of the time. Half right is... In the name of Jesus, I command you, evil spirit, demon, to get out of my life and leave me alone. All right, that's the half right part. But I'm telling you why that's 0% effective. It's because as long as they have a legal contract by you that you have not canceled, they don't have to leave. When you've made an agreement with the enemy, you can holler and scream in Jesus' name all you want, and they're just like, I got a contract with you. Remember that agreement we made back then? I mean, you might not even have made it. You didn't even know you made it, but you did. I mean, you knew, but you didn't know you were doing that. You didn't know the devil was in on that. So now you know. So now you've got to cancel it. And you remember when I said that 
demons aren't omniscient. I mean, they're, they're not all-knowing. They don't know what you're thinking. You have to speak it verbally. If I want to talk to God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, I just think it a lot. Sometimes I'll talk verbally, but I can think it. If I need to talk to a demon, which the only reason I talk to him is to cancel a contract, I've got to do it verbally. Because they can't read my mind. They're not omniscient. They don't have that. Only God has that. So, so getting to rescue yourself and others from the influence of the enemy, of demonic oppression, you have, it's a two-step process. You've got to close doors, cancel contracts, and then kick them out in the name of Jesus. So you start with finding out your open doors. Oh, here's where I partnered with him. Here's where I opened that door. And you've got to start verbally canceling contracts. Demon, evil spirit that causes anxiety in me, um, I, I cancel all contracts with you now in Jesus' name. I break any agreements I ever made with you. I don't partner with that anymore. Okay, you've broke that contract. Now, that doesn't free you from demonic influence. That frees you from th- your obligation that they can stay. And, then you, and now, in the name of Jesus... I command you to to get out of my life. Leave me alone in Jesus' name. They have to go. They have to, have to, have to. Why? Because they're defeated. Jesus Christ defeated. We're just just enforcing the, the, the victory that he already won for us. So they got there by our agreement, not Jesus just letting them run willy nilly, right? He's given us power and authority, the keys to the kingdom, bind what we want to bind, loose what we loose, you know. In God's will, you understand what I'm saying. And if, if we agree with the devil, and then we've opened that up. He's defeated, and he's given us power and authority. He's given us knowledge in the Holy Spirit, so we, we don't agree with the devil, but we do, ignorantly, which is different than being stupid, right? So don't, I'm not calling you stupid. But we're all ignorant when, when we let the devil in with legal consent, and then they just, he just hammers us. Uh, is, is this making sense? Are you, are you following me? Are you getting to understand deliverance a little bit better? What, this, what we're being delivered from? And so, because <laughs> there was this, uh, I think it was a commercial, and I, I've tried to find it on YouTube, but I can't even remember who it was for, but, you know, really good commercials, you remember who they're for, even though they're stupid commercials. But like really cool commercials, you never remember who they're for, because you just remember the cool commercial, right? So, um, but it was a commercial where this monster comes into a kid's room. And now you think I'm thinking of Monsters, Inc. And it's kind of like that. But no, it was a commercial where the, the monster blows itself up real big. And the kid's like, you don't scare me. He's like, oh. he goes out, you know. And he turns into this little gnat. That's kind of like the enemy. If the enemy knows that you don't know who you are in Christ knows that you don't have a clue about power and authority, you don't have a clue, you don't have a clue about these contracts and, and how to get rid of the enemy, they're going to blow themselves up real big and really, really try and scare you <laughs> or, or bring a mess to your life. But when you really find out what their gig is, that they are defeated, that you have power and authority over them and that you don't have to put up with that, you just need to verbally cancel those contracts Tell them in the name of Jesus to get out of your life. They just turn into this little bzzz, and they buzz off. It says it in James 4, 7. Resist the devil and you will flee. That's our, that's our, other, our point here today is that resist the devil and he'll, he'll leave. Why? Because he's not omnipresent. Devil and demons can only be at one place at one time. And if you know who you are in Christ, know that you have power and authority, know that you can cancel those contracts, know that in the name of Jesus you can kick them out, they're not going to spend a bunch of time with you because legally they have to go. Again, like I said, you don't outshout the devil, you don't outpower the devil, you outtruth him. And the truth is, he is a, he's a defeated foe. And I cancel all legal agreements that I made and I kick you out in Jesus' name and legally, because of what Jesus did on the cross, he has to, has to, has to, has to obey that. And Jesus enforces that, not me. And so, so that's how, <laughs> how we get rid of that. But the enemy's looking for people who don't know that. And that's where they'll go spend their time. So when you get it and you resist the devil, it's like, I know who you are and I'm not going to listen to you anymore. In Jesus, and you do all the stuff I just talked about. 
I mean, they might hang around for a little bit and try and, and, try and make another run at you, but you're like, don't be ridiculous. I know who you are. They'll, they'll go look for somebody else, all right? So, and this, and this, uh, talking about this and this, when we open doors, make agreements, whatever you want to call it, when the enemy, like, it's not possession. Remember, it's not possession, but they just gain access to our soul. It's more of an access thing. When they speak in our soul, it sounds so much like us. It's so clear and so in there. It's like, whoa, that's got to be me. That's got to be a great idea. As opposed to when the enemy's out here where they're at, right? And when it's out there, it's like, I see what that is. Stop it. That's, that's ridiculous, all right? There's a big difference than when they're out here than when they're in here. That's why you've got to get them out, which is not possessions, right? So there's not like an exorcism or anything like that. It's canceling that legal access they have to our soul and shutting their big fat mouth because their big fat mouth is in our soul just going, dee, 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 trying all the time. They have assignments and, they, and there's an army of them working together. Like, my job's fear. I'm going to bring in fear. Oh, I'm not even going to go there. Anyway, I just... We could, we could go all morning talking about that. But, but they start saying things and they want you to believe it. Like, I don't know. You're the one, you're the one that, that's unlovable. That's, that's you. People have tried to love you and they just can't. You're, you're unlovable, obviously. So resign yourself to a lonely life from here on out. You're the one that's, that's misbehaved one too many times. You're the one that has taken the cross of Christ to the limit and beyond, and I'm sorry you've gone too far. It's a lying voice of the enemy. You're the one that comes to church and puts on a good face on Sunday, and you have the worst thoughts, and you're doing this and this and this on the rest of the week. Who do you think you are? Just drop out now. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. I could, and I could probably tell everybody's story. I mean, not that I know your story, but I'm, I mean, we all like, yeah, I, I recognize that voice. You're the one from the wrong side of the tracks, and you will always live on the wrong side of the tracks, so just forget about it. You know, forget about any, you have any success in life. You're the one that's not smart. Remember what your teacher said in fourth grade? Remember that? Because they like to remind you of things that other people said under the influence of the enemy. Because they're all in it together. And they could just beat you down and impress you and get you a place where like, what's the use? I talk to people all the time who are, the, what's, the, what's the use? Because the enemy has got them so beat down. That's why, you, you know, I, you think I talk too much about Freedom Weekend, the, the event that we have a couple times a year? I'm not talking about too much because I've seen people get free at that event <laughs> in that, that eight hours from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Get free of that so they'll no longer say, what's the use? They get a new lease on life. They get a fresh perspective. They get rid of that heaviness that Satan has just piled on over years and years and years of those lies and that influence that you just need to see for what it is and get rid of it. <laughs> okay, one, one quick story. As I'm telling the story, we can have the worship team come up. Economize our time here. I didn't even check my notes. I don't even know if I'm done preaching anyway, but I got to tell the story. Um, some of you heard it. Uh, it was a year ago when we were at Faith Center for Freedom Weekend. We have Freedom Weekend here sometimes, and sometimes we have it in Great Falls. And this uh, coming uh, February 21st, it's in Great Falls at Faith Center, Four Square Church, the one out there by North 40 or whatever it's called now, used to be Big R. So we've done, I don't know, three or four or five there. I, I, there's not five, but we've done three or four. This will be three or four. But we were there a year ago. And uh, I, I, I don't, I was just watching, I was kind of overseeing things and and uh, there was a gal that was just heavy all day. I mean, you could just, she just came in. You know what I mean by heavy? She's like, 
like pig pen in on Charlie Brown, you know, just a cloud around him. That cloud of heaviness, depression, it was just a dark cloud she came in with. And it was just seemed like it was, there. It just, I mean, maybe there was a little activity going on there that was helping her, but it just, it just wasn't happening. And, um, but the Lord was doing things. And I, looked, I just looked over there, and she was praying with somebody, and the Lord said, go um, tell her that I'm restoring her joy. Go, go, give, go minister my joy to her. And I'm looking at her like, okay, but she, man, she's a long ways from that. And so I went over there, and um, at that time we had name tags that were printed only on one side. And for whatever reason, they'd always flip around so you could never see anybody's name. Now we've learned to print them on, the name on both sides because I like to call people by their name, right? And it just makes it feel more intimate or whatever. But her, I couldn't see her name. It had flipped over. And um, so I was just talking to her and, and uh, said, you know, the Lord wants um, to restore your joy. And I just, I just feel like I'm just supposed to minister that to you. He's just going to give it to you supernaturally. I mean, I mean, you've gone through all this stuff. You've done all you need to do. But there's still this heaviness. And I come to find out afterwards, okay, after the fact, she tells me all this. She's been in like heavy depression like three years. Like suicidal like husband, like at the end of his rope, I don't know what to do for her or with her. I don't, I don't know. I'm at the end of my rope. She's at the end of her rope. She's a believer. She wants all that. This is not happening. I mean, all, we found all this out later. But anyway, so I just minister the joy of the Lord. I mean, for him to supernaturally implant his joy into her. And she gets it. She started to wake up, and it started to bubble up. And I, I get, I get, just, it's gonna bubble, and it just started bubbling up. And she started giggling and laughing, and pretty soon she's laughing and crying, all you know, good crying. And she, and when she gets done, the tears are coming out. She's laughing. She takes her name and turns her name tag over. Her name's Joy. So, yeah, that's a good story. It's it's just God. God cares, and He's gonna do stuff, but He wants you. He uses you to do it, and me. You can minister joy to joy, or you know what I'm saying? We're his hands and his feet. We're called to do it, but you got to get free yourself. How can, how can you rescue somebody else if you're not rescued yourself, right? And I wish we could do, I wish we could just, Snap our fingers and you're free of all that right now. I wish we could do it in five minutes of prayer time at the altar. But, you know, to be honest, we just can't. I mean, we can't. We can pray things for you and we will. And, and, and in fact, we'll just, we wouldn't have the worship team come up now to pray or the prayer team. Okay, prayer team, if you want to come up, those who are praying this morning, we're gonna have, we are going to have a prayer time that you can pray for anything you need and, and we'll pray for things. But there, there are some things that the enemy has laid in over years and years and years and you might not be able to get rid of it in three minutes of prayer all right or five minutes it's going to take a freedom weekend day it's going to take a 9 a.m to 5 p.m day to do it and i'm telling you it will happen but it takes it's more than we can do right now and i'm not trying to undersell our prayer time because because god is is he's god and he'll do things but sometimes we need to go through this process of closing doors and 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 canceling all these legal contracts and and getting understanding of who we are identity in christ and 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 kicking them out and that takes some time and so that's why i encourage you to to go to freedom weekend it's just not some event that we're trying to make money off it's it's delivering people from demonic influence so that you can live the life that christ called you to live so please (laughs) register and go we will have prayer time now as the, as the worship team leads and as we close. And if, if you do need prayer, like maybe you just need some peace, joy, you got anxiety, you got fear, just the Lord can still work on that. He can still do those things. He can give you a measure of release. Maybe you just need to pray for a relative or a friend. Whatever you need prayer for this morning, uh, we invite you to come forward and pray uh, with these people. Let's close in prayer this morning. Father, Thank you for giving us authority through Jesus, through your son Jesus, authority over all the power of the enemy. 
Jesus, thank you that you defeated Satan on the cross so that we don't have to fear him. We don't have to even deal with him if we, if we learn to take our thoughts captive. And Holy Spirit, help us to do that. Help us to take our thoughts captive so that we will not unknowingly make agreements with the enemy. Lord, I'm asking you to show us over these next minutes and hours and days our areas of agreement with the enemy so that we can rescind those agreements, we can cut those contracts and kick out that influence of the enemy out of our soul so that we can be free from that. Show us those areas, Lord. Help us to remember the authority and power we have through you, Jesus, over the enemy. So, Lord, now as we, as we pray, Lord, I just pray that you begin to set people free, help them to start closing doors and canceling agreements and living free and claiming what you said in John 10.10, 10, that you, you came to give us the abundant life and, that, and, whoever the, and whoever you set free is indeed free. We thank you for that in Jesus' name.